What's up everybody and welcome to another video. The Witcher on Netflix was released on the 20th of December. Wow. I have waited. A lot of people have waited. For a while. If you didn't watch my two previous videos that I did on The Witcher reacting to the trailers, please go do that. Just so you kind of get a sense of how much I love The Witcher franchise and how much I was looking forward to this. And now that it's finally out, I have to say, that's pretty damn good. I am so happy that it's, that I love it. I love it. I freaking love what I've seen so far. Just a quick thing. There are eight episodes. Each episode is one hour. And so I don't think I can provide a review of eight hours of story and characters and footage and, and whatnot in good conscience accurately and to the best of my ability in, in just one video. So I'm breaking up into two parts. For the first part, which is this, is the first four episodes and the next part is the next four, the last four. In my Star Wars review, which I did a couple of days ago, which by the way, if you haven't seen yet, either go watch it now or, or and come back or watch it later. I broke it down into aspects of the, of the film that I didn't like. In this case, I'll do it by episodes. Um, but I'll start off with what I felt in general was great about it. But before we get started, I just want to say that this is a spoiler review. I will be talking about moments that are just straight up spoilers, so yeah. So in general, I loved the set pieces and the world that they've built. I thought it was very fitting for The Witcher. I also thought the soundtrack was great. Very, very similar to the game, The Witcher 3's soundtrack, which I love that. So a thumbs up all around for that. The cinematography in, in each episode kept me captivated and engaged the entire time. Specifically, um, the f coloring I thought was very fitting, dark and gritty. I thought they played around with the framing as well, which offered a break from just the normal close-ups, mid-shots, all that. Um, they did a lot of Dutch angles, I noticed. They also used a lot of camera movement in place of static shots that, that help engage the audience more. The tone of not just the subdued colors, but also uh, just in general the tone they've created. So yeah, that's in general what I loved about these first four episodes. Now let's go on to specifically episode one. Wow, this is how you start a series, yes. Yes. Oh, episode one was so good. One of the first things that really stood out to me in the first episode was how they introduced the exposition. When Geralt first visits Stregobor, they kind of have a discussion about witchers and they establish that witchers are a dying breed and there's not a lot of them left. And also that mages and sorcerers are a thing. They're like a normal known thing in this world, in this universe. And I felt that the way they delivered the exposition through the dialogue felt completely natural. I could totally see somebody who is new to this world and this universe and this franchise just uh, taking all the exposition in and, and registering that information naturally. Like it's, it doesn't stand out in a bad way. The performances, wow. Like Henry Cavill completely nailed Geralt. I was just completely captivated in, in his performance. It, but also the performances from Frey Allen and Jodie May and everybody else. Uh, Adam Levy, oh, great, so good, so good. And the final thing that I felt was just so perfect for starting off the series was the fight choreography. There were two fight scenes. The first one was the battle outside of Sintra and it was a bit chaotic, like kind of hard to follow, but I think that's what the director and the cinematographer had intended because it was essentially the Nilfgaardians massacring the Sintrans. And I think what else was intended was to capture how much of a badass Geralt of Rivia is. That final fight scene, oh my god. Wow, that that is how you film good sword fighting. Oh my goodness, the fight choreography as well. The way they shot it, the way the the way it was choreographed. Wow. So yeah, that's what I loved about the first episode. I have two I just have two minor quips about about the first episode. The first one was the Nilfgaardian armor. It just looked kind of strange to me. Um, I don't remember how it was described in the books, but yeah, it just looked a bit weird. It, it low-key triggered my trypophobia, so there's that. And then the second thing was when Calanthe, Queen Calanthe was injured, there was nobody attending to her wounds. I was like, this is your queen! Somebody get her a medic! So yeah, that's the first episode. On to the second episode! 
Now, as much as I love the first episode, the second one stood out, but in a bad way. Especially after I, I finished watching the second, the third and fourth episode, the second episode felt really out of place, I kind of want to say. I, I'll start off with what I thought was good real quick again. The performances again. Wow, Anya Chalotra's performance is amazing. Can you not scratch up my chair, dude? Yeah, wow, I, words, there are no words that I can find that could even come close to describing how good Anya Chalotra's performance was just in that episode alone. I thought the episode perfectly captured the dynamic between Geralt and Yaskier slash Dandelion right from the start. Again, I thought the, the way they delivered the exposition and the world building was completely natural. They never overload you with it. And when they do, they kind of call it out like what Yaskier did. And in terms of world building, we got to see a little bit of how mages and sorcerers work in this world. I also really like the realism. Not just in this episode, but it's like throughout the all the episodes. Like in the books, Geralt does not carry his sword around with him all the time. Because he doesn't need to. And he also doesn't ride Roach all the time. Because he doesn't need to. And I thought they, they you know, that just added a little bit more realism to the world. Um, and uh, the, the world of The Witcher, even though it is fantasy, there are more elements of realism in it than most fantasy uh worlds lord of the rings game of thrones just to name a few that's kind of i think that's what i really love about the witcher okay now on to why i think this episode felt out of place the pacing was really slow and what legolas is meowing because he wants to go out dude i'm filming i can't can you just wait a couple minutes please yeah the pacing of this one was really slow and I think it's because there was too much emotional baggage scenes and too much moral baggage scenes and when I say baggage I don't mean like it was dragging down the quality I meant I, I mean it's a lot to take in especially Yennefer's storyline Yennefer's introduction and her storyline in this one was like wow I, you really feel terrible for her you also feel terrible for Ciri and what she has to go through now that her home was burnt down. And then there was really no action, even on Geralt's storyline, except for the end with, with the Nilf Guardians raiding the camp that Ciri was in, but that's pretty much it. You know, and when it cut to Geralt, it was a moral dilemma about him trying to deal, about trying to talk with the elves about how they should go about moving on after being horribly kicked out of their own lands and, and having no choice but to either move or submit to human rule. Like after watching a lot of emotional and moral baggage scenes, the audience needs their blood to get pumping again, you know, or else it just seems like it kind of drags on too much. I think another reason this was is because they were juggling too many storylines too early into the into the series. You've introduced Yennefer and all the people she's going to meet, and then you're continuing Ciri's storyline and all the new people, sh all the new characters she's gonna meet, and then you're also continuing Geralt's storyline and all the new people he's going to meet. You know, it's a lot. It's a lot of information for the audience to have to take in on in only the second episode. So I think sequentially, maybe they should have switched Geralt's storyline from episode two with his storyline from episode four because we also get the, the continuation of, it's not necessarily con a continuation, but we have the familiarity of the characters, Kalanthi, Ice, Twirsek, um, Mausak. So we're not necessarily meeting new characters, we're just meeting them in a different point in time and in different circumstances. Hey, 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 stop it. Can you calm down, for, can you go back to sleep? So yeah, other than that one last thing, I'm looking down on my notes, by the way, that's why I keep looking down. The tone and coloring of the second episode was brighter than the first one. More brighter, more brighter. The scenes with Geralt and Yaskier were very brightly lit and sunny, and even some of Yennefer's scenes in Arethusa were... the colors were quite vibrant. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if that was intentional. It just made... I, I don't know. It, it just made the episode stand out even more than it already did. But whatever. Moving on to episode 3. Right off the bat, I just want to say... 
the characters in the world of The Witcher are so deep and so complex, morally, emotionally, even physically. And I just want to thank Lauren Hisrick for capturing that. Because that's what I—that's the strongest aspect, in my opinion, of the Witcher universe. Subkovsky's writing really tries to teach you to not judge a person so quickly, especially from a moral standpoint, because you don't know their whole story, you don't know their motivations, you don't know if they have been wronged, you don't know what their intent is. You cannot judge them completely unless you know the whole story, their whole story. And I think that was perfectly captured with the i forgot his name but he was like the court attendant or the guy who Geralt ties up on the bed and then gets ripped open by the striga and i mean even full test even full test you think that he's he oh god it's so good i can't i can't my mind is just running with how good this is just between full test and the court guy and even tris it's just like a web of lies and manipulation and, and trying to cover up the truth that once you brush all of that away and once you do discover the truth, it's never black and white. It's always gray. It's always morally gray. This is what I said in my first reaction to The Witcher. Subkovsky loves moral gray dilemmas. This episode really was important for giving the audience a sense of Geralt's unique perspective on life. Because he is a monster hunter, who hunts down and kills monsters in a world where humans can be just as bad if not worse than the monsters he hunts life is just money and monsters to him right that's all that's all it has to be just simple right but obviously it's not and and Geralt has had several experiences with that his own philosophy challenged it's not just money and monsters right and I think Geralt's perspective on life is that he is that he tries to preserve as much life as possible whether it be human life or non-human life the reason why he didn't give up on the princess and why he he felt like he needed to save to at least try to save this princess is because he failed to remain inactive in the in the in the circumstances of Ren Princess Renfrey. Despite him trying to remain neutral, his hand was forced in the in the worst possible outcome. And that's why he felt such a need to at least try to save this princess. We also got a sense of this perspective of life that he has um, with the Sylvan in episode two when he said, because the Sylvan is intelligent, he wouldn't kill it. And that is a, it's a, it's a thing in the books and in the games that Geralt doesn't kill uh, intelligent monsters like succubus and, and sylvan unless really unless really really provoked and again the performances i'm not actually sure if i said this at the start but if i did one of the general things that i loved about what i saw so far is the performances all around all all across the board and then again we return to the darker tone in this episode which again kind of makes the second episode stand out even more but in terms of the tone of this uh, uh, episode, it was straight up scary. Like I was terrified of the of the of the Striga, and in in tandem with the sound design of, of the Striga's roars, it, they weren't really roars. They were like screams, like blood curdling screams. They were it was terrifying. Yeah, that whole that whole sequence was really well directed. I don't really have anything bad to say about this episode. Like this episode was. Just ugh, so amazing, every aspect of it. Finally, the fourth episode. I don't actually have a lot of notes to say on this one because a lot of what I already said about the previous three episodes applies to this one. Performances, soundtrack, tone, all of that. But I guess two in particular, one of them was the world building. We got a really important detail about this world, which is the role that destiny plays in this in this in the witcher and especially Geralt's view on destiny's role he thinks that that it's just a made up concept that fools humans into thinking that there's an order to things i think that something along the lines that's what he said but then obviously uh he kind of he's going to have to start believing in that shite because Ciri's coming hot on his tail. <laughs> so yeah, destiny is a big thing in this world. 
you probably noticed already by how many times they mentioned it in the previous three episodes before this one. And another thing in particular that stood out to me in this episode was the action and the fight choreography. This one was kind of a mix of the fight of the two fight scenes in the in the first episode, where it was a blend of chaos, but you could still have someone. You had you always had someone to pay attention to. Um, what, and then you like your peripherals kind of recognize that there's action and, and fighting going on in the background. The choreography again was awesome. I thought also I just thought it was straight up pretty epic. I thought it was pretty damn epic when when Ice Tudorsek was like, the law of surprise has been called, and then he starts fighting with Geralt and Dooney and oh, and then Calanthe comes down with the sword, and like you think she's gonna start fighting Ice Tudorsek, but she fights. I guess her own <laughs> soldiers, I guess. Awesome. It's just straight up epic. I also like that we got to see how Siri starts to learn how terrible the world she is in is. But yeah, um, that's, that's about it. Oh, I'm so happy. I really am so happy and even a little bit re relieved that this turned out to be so good, at least to me. I loved it. I personally loved it. So good. Such a good time to be a fan of The Witcher. So yeah, that's it for the video, guys. Stay tuned for part two. But in the meantime, if you like this video, give it a like. If you have something to say in response to my comments or otherwise, do so in the comments down below. And I want to give a special shout out and say thank you to my patrons on Patreon. So awesome with the donations, as always. And finally, if you want to support me, subscribe and see more content like this. Other than that, I will see you all in the next video. Goodbye!